Today's topic is remote simulation, how to adapt and maximize learning outcomes. I'd like to introduce our host today, Darren LaCroix from Lairdall Medical. He's our senior program manager with Lairdall Medical. Darren, thank you very much for joining us. Take over. Hi, thank you, Andrew, and uh, good morning to all of our attendees. I, I say good morning, I'm on the West Coast. Uh, um, similar to many of you, I'm sitting at my home office um, in Hokiam, Washington. And, uh, but I am really glad to be here today, and especially to be here um, with our guests, um, because like you, uh, I think that we have all been looking for a way to, to really revamp our simulation. And although we, the COVID and the uh, forced our hand here, um, I think that we may have been moving in that direction. And so today with us, uh, we have from the Gordon Center at the University of Miami, um, Dr. Ross Scalise and Samantha Sims, who will be joining us. And uh, so I'd like to introduce Dr. Scalise, um, Ross, if you'd give us a little rundown about um, who you are and what you do there at the University of Miami. Thanks very much, Darren. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, yes, I'm Ross Scalise. I'm an Associate Professor of Medicine at the University of Miami Miller School of Medicine and at the Gordon Center for Simulation and Innovation in Medical Education. I am the Director of Educational Technology Development. By clinical background, I'm an internist. At the medical school, I sit on the executive curriculum committee and I'm involved in uh, clinical skills training and the competency assessment programs. Thank you, Ross. And uh, it sounds like you have a lot on your plate there at the University of Miami. So it's uh, good to have you today. And uh, Samantha, um, could you tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do at the University of Miami? Thank you, Darren. My name is Samantha Sims. I am the director of the standardized patient program here at the Gordon Center. Uh, as well as the University of Miami Miller School of Medicine. Thank you, Samantha. So I'm familiar with the University of Miami Gordon Center, um, having been in the simulation field for um, since 1984. Um, I've certainly uh, turned to some of the guidance coming out of the Gordon Center, but I think that uh, there, may, there may be many of our viewers or listeners today, Ross, that don't know much about really what you do and, and to the extent that you do do it. So if you wouldn't mind, if you could give us a, a, a snapshot of your simulation center and let us know about the various activities that the Gordon Center does. Sure, it's my pleasure. Um, the Gordon Center is one of the centers of excellence of the University of Miami. It's named for its founder, Dr. Michael S. Gordon, um, who was a renowned cardiologist and really a pioneer in many areas of medical education, um, including simulation. He's probably best known as the inventor of one of the first and certainly the longest standing of the computerized mannequin in medical education. Um, some of you may be familiar with Harvey, the cardiopulmonary patient simulator, um, which made its debut at the American Heart Association scientific meeting way back in 1968. Um, and it was only a few years later that he began what was then called the Medical Simulation and Training Laboratory at the university, which was probably the first medical simulation center in the world. Um, later, it was renamed the Center for Research in Medical Education to reflect uh, the fact that we carried out, we didn't just produce a simulator and implement simulation programs, but we actually carried out outcomes-based educational research um, into the effectiveness of that. Um, later, or more recently, we've moved into our current facilities. That was in 2007. Um, and the center at that time was renamed in Dr. Gordon's honor. Um, we occupy about 34,000 square feet of, of space um, in one of the newer buildings on our medical campus. We have two floors um, and comprises three divisions of our center. Um, the division of uh, research and technology is the one that I direct, um, which is actually where we make the Harvey simulators and develop some of our e-learning programs and other technologies. Um, our largest division, though, is actually pre-hospital and emergency training. And some people may think because we're here at the medical school that the medical students would be our largest learner population, but actually we train very many paramedics, EMTs, and other first responders. Another division um, which doesn't occupy a specific space, but is part of the philosophy of our center, um, is 
we call it multi-professional education. Probably nowadays, the buzz phrase would be interprofessional education, of which Dr. Gordon was one of the very first advocates, believing firmly back in the 1980s, before anybody was talking about IPE, that we should be training not just doctors, um, but nurses, paramedics, physician assistants, anyone on the healthcare team, um, training them together and to a very high standard. We are a very large volume center with all of these learner populations. We train on site nearly 5,000 um, people per year. And using our curricula, which we disseminate worldwide, we train greater than 15,000 learners annually. So I think uh, the Gordon Center rightfully can claim uh, quite a significant impact uh, in health professions education worldwide. Thank you. I picked up on a, a comment that you made that I found really interesting there, which was about um, that your, your interest in outcome-based education. And I think that's something certainly we can all be um, uh, understanding now, because uh, um, as we move into the fall with the uncertainty of uh, what's going to happen, in fact, I think many organizations are certain um, what's going to happen, um, but they have put the onus back on us about um, um, doing this remotely. And so, Sam, um, this next question is for you, is that uh, as we go into the fall um, coming up here, um, I, would I would suspect that you're increasing greatly the amount of remote simulation. Tell us a little bit about that. Sure, definitely. I think that this was really the push that many of us needed to transition or dive headfirst into remote simulation. Um, over the past few months, it's become evident that telehealth and remote simulation is here to stay far beyond the pandemic. Now, I believe it's our job to develop training and assessment to educate our learners on best practices in remote sim and continue to explore how technology can assist us in doing so. I agree. I, I, I think that um, this, uh, the direction was there. Um, but I think now that the impetus is is very strong, and so um, I, I know myself um, in working with um, other uh, organizations, we get questioned all the time of how do we do this? How do we deliver? What are you doing? And again, that's what we thank you two for being being on today. So um, with that in mind, what I'd really like to do now is, um, Nick, if we can go to a poll uh, question uh, for our uh, participants here, and we'll give you a brief moment to answer this. Um, I'm interested, and I think this was, might have been one of my questions. Uh, what are your plans for simulation activities this fall? Um, will you just be doing normal activities in your center? A hybrid of a virtual and uh, in-person type activity? Um, all virtual? or have you just suspended all activities? So I'm gonna give everyone just a moment to, uh, to vote and then we'll have those displayed. I'll be interested to see our results. Okay, wow, interesting um, that 14% of our users will be doing normal simulation activities um, this year. Congratulations, uh, that I think uh, uh, to be able to, to move to that. Um, hybrid of virtual activities so it seems to be our largest um, at 69%. Um, there'll be some virtual, there'll be some type of hybrid work. Again, um, something that I, I, I look forward to hearing about. 13% um, of you are doing all virtual, and there are 5% that have had to suspend all activities. So um, interesting poll results. Ross, what, do you, um, what, what is your take on that? Well, I, I think it kind of reflects what our experience has been. Um, back in mid-March, um, we made the shift to all virtual right then when cases were rapidly rising in the U.S. We um, pulled our clinical phase students out of the clinical environment. So uh, medical students were no longer doing rotations directly in the hospital. We went to all virtual. But now as we've had time to you know, think through protocols and, and develop some procedures, we, are, we have resumed some in-person simulation activities, but we're doing that with a hybrid format. Um, especially the didactic portions, we realize now um, that we don't need to bring people together into a large auditorium for purely didactic type of things that can be done as pre-learning remotely and then we are bringing people in for what can only be done really through hands-on type of practice um, we bring those in to our center for in-person simulation activities 
So uh, kind of with that same thing in mind. So um, we know we're going that way. Um, I think that um, agreeing with Sam, um, this is certainly a direction we were going. I'm wondering, um, do you, what is the transformational change in curricula that you might have to engage in to uh, go remote? Yeah, so I, it might be a little bit of semantics, but w one thing I'd, I'd like to clarify, or at least it's been our approach, is that we're not changing the curriculum, um, or at least we're not changing the outcomes, right? Those have been predetermined. And I think, as you mentioned early on, we're in the era of outcomes or competency-based education. So every uh, health professions institution, I'm sure, has their institutional educational objectives that they're trying to meet. What must their learners know? be able to do, um, how must they behave, and so forth. So that hasn't changed, and, and those really shouldn't change. But then in keeping with curricular alignment, then you have to look at what are the teaching methods teaching toward those objectives, and then to close the loop, you always have to assess whether or not you achieved your objectives. So what we've had to adapt are the teaching methods and the assessment methods. Rather, the outcomes have remained fixed. Um, and I think an important point to making that successful is to make sure that you have institutional support, that this is well integrated. If simulation centers try to do this on their own and make what they're doing kind of standalone, it's not going to work toward the achievement of the, the larger goals. One thing that you mentioned at the very beginning, and you had highlighted our mission statement in that one photo overhead, was, was our mission statement at the Gordon Center, saving lives through simulation technology. Um, I know that's similar to the, to the Lairdahl mission statement as well, helping save lives. Dr. Gordon always would keep us focused on the first part, the saving lives is, is really what we're all about. The simulation technology is not an end unto itself, or now in this case, we might be talking about e-learning or remote technologies, right? Virtual patients and so forth. Those are all the means to the end. We hope to use those tools to improve our training and thereby the people that we train, we hope will take better care of patients. So I think we need to keep that big picture in mind um, and then make sure that we align the different components of the curriculum, the teaching methods, the assessment methods with those higher objectives. Excellent. I, I think that uh, some takeaway points that, that I certainly picked up right there are um, uh, make sure you're looking at your outcomes, right? Um, we are having to change technology delivery, um, but those outcomes are really what, what, what we should be basing even our remote training to. Also, I think that you're um, uh, talking about assessment and the use of assessing those outcomes and grabbing the spe you know, specific outcome uh, that you desire, um, working towards it and demonstrating improvement, I think, are, are all part of that. Probably a good time to do this. Um, I think that I don't want to say most of us have more time on our hands. In fact, I'd probably say we have less because we're being asked exactly to do this. Um, but this is a good chance too to uh, to revisit that for those of you who um, are struggling where to begin with your remote with your remote sessions. Um, with that, uh, let's let's do another poll, Nick. If you'd put up another poll, and in this poll, what we're looking for is um, what is your rate your level of competence in conducting virtual education um you know how is it how do you do it have you never conducted virtual training have you attempted it and need more practice um limited success with your virtual training um it went very well but could use some more resources or you're the whip and you you can do virtual training very comfortably so take a moment please and answer that and uh, let's see how our audience is responding here Oh, wow, 25% uh, uh, of our respondees have never conducted virtual training at this point. And uh, um, oh, good for you. Um, again, this is going to bring you into that world and I think we'll show. Uh, we've had, got a lot of people who conducted it and need a little bit of practice, some with limited success. Um, but we've got a lot that actually are doing very well. That's good news. 32% uh, of our respondees have conducted it, um, went well, but could use some more resources to help them. So, um, and 6% of you are probably have been doing this for some time, I think, uh, to, to get that. Very good. So thank you.
you got muted there again, Darren. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, Sam, um, I was going to ask you, how are you preparing to deliver your standardized patient encounters? And when I say standardized patient from, for many on the line, um, that's the OSCE. Um, kind of interested in how you're preparing to deliver those. Sure. So in short, with a lot of trial and error and troubleshooting, uh, as with any new process, there's inevitable challenges along the way. We went through a few web-based platforms before deciding to move forward with Zoom for our remote SP sessions. For us, there were um, a high technological learning curve for several of our SPs. So we held a series of trainings to acclimate them to the Zoom environment to be able to do things such as sharing their screen with the learners and record live sessions. So this was formally done in person with staff monitoring in the session in a separate room. After this training, we were able to run a large scale multi-station OSCE for approximately 20 standardized patients and 200 students. We were able to train some SPs to work fully remotely and those who needed extra assistance, we asked them to come into campus. Uh, we were able to coordinate again with leadership to expand the space available for the SPs to basically have a room to themselves. And we had extra staff on hand to assist with any tech issues. We've also had to alter the way that we provide physical exam findings, as I'm sure many SP educators out there have realized, it's very difficult to do physical exam on Zoom. So we currently utilize two different methods. First, we trained our SPs to elicit which components of the physical exam the student wishes to perform, and the SP would verbalize their findings. Or, alternatively, we would ask our SPs to share their screen, which would display the physical findings, similar to SPs handing findings cards over to the students in person. Uh, it took a lot of prep work, but we were uh, able to successfully adapt our OSCEs fully online. So you utilize Zoom, you said. Um, certainly that does take a little bit of um, um, teaching. Um, you mentioned about the preparing the standardized patients um, who, you know, you obviously want the consistency that were there. Um, Ross, I'm interested in what's your response from, um, from faculty to this? Um, certainly probably faculty had to adopt to utilizing Zoom as a means to assess. Yes, not, not just to assess, but also for on the teaching side of things too. Um, I don't want to stereotype and say there was a little bit of a generational divide. Um, some of our more senior faculty aren't as comfortable with using some of the technological methods. Um, and so we just had to provide them with some extra support. So for example, one of our, uh, the director of our cardiology training programs here at the Gordon Center, one of our very respected teachers at the medical school. He's won the, the student elected teaching awards for about a, a dozen years in a row. Um, obviously a great teacher, but then to manage looking at the chat window, managing the polling questions and things like that, it was a bit uh, too much bandwidth at the beginning. Um, so we had technical people in the background who could run the poll for him who could advance the slides or to monitor the chat window and then feed the questions to him. Um, because it really is a, a multitasking thing that, that's quite a different skill set than lecturing live. Um, but by and large, people have come along and the, since the response from students has been so great and since everyone appreciates uh, the necessity of doing this, again, a senior faculty member himself had concerns about his own health coming in to campus, you know, or, you know, standing in front of a, a crowded lecture room. So um, I think it was a win-win on all sides after a little bit of acclimation period. Yes, I, I can imagine so. Um, I, um, and you, you mentioned about assessment. And so I would, uh, do you pilot, um, did you pilot these activities with faculty, with SPs? Sam, maybe that's uh, for you. Did, were there pilot sessions run where you could kind of work out some of these issues? Definitely. Like I said, there was a lot of trial and error involved. Uh, we had to pilot um, remote OSCE several times before all the pieces came together, right? Standardized patients need to know how to access the breakout rooms, um, how to access our system from home. So there was a lot of trial and error involved with piloting these OSCEs. 
And we're able to try that out more in some of the lower stakes formative type of assessments um, where we you know, maybe had one or two stations that each student went through. So it was easier to kind of work out some of the bugs there. We wanted to make sure we did that before our summative end of third year OSCE, as Sam mentioned, where we had 200 students going through a, a multiple station um, assessment. And those, because it was higher stakes, we also had to be sure that we were recording all of those um, so that if we needed to do any verification or you know, double check inter-rater reliabilities, we had those recordings on hand to, to review after the fact. Good. So I really hear a couple of things there about uh, making sure, and I think that uh, it, this can ease a lot of our minds, is that um, it, this does need to be piloted. It does need to be tried. We need to try it in small chunks and make sure what the direction that we're going in, the technology that we're using, um, does what we want it to. And so uh, I think that's a very good takeaway also um, in, in assessing your program, as you mentioned, inter-rater reliability. Um, you know, how do the um, SPs um, grade according to, uh, say, matching with the faculty? So uh, I think everyone should take a breath and realize that um, we do have um, uh, some practice, some ways to go. It doesn't have to be perfect coming out of the gate. So I'd like to go to a poll then, last poll question actually for our audience. And uh, this poll question relates to um, um, what are the biggest concerns that you have? You know, I really like that we had a very good distribution, actually, of people doing things different ways. But what's your biggest concern right now about delivering virtual training? Is it keeping the students engaged? Is it the use of technology? Um, assessment of learning? How do we assess it? Um, or again, um, you just that confident, you confident in your ability to deliver and assess your virtual training sessions. So we'll give you a moment and answer that. Um, the um, student engagement in technology relatively um, the same, 33 to 29% of our um, users say that's difficult. Um, I really find the third one interesting about assessment of learning, that 35% um, find this difficult um, to do um, with the assessment. And so I think that um, we can really talk about that, um, Ross, when we talk about your virtual clerkship. And so um, tell us a little bit, because we, we were speaking of OSCEs, but tell us a little bit about that transition from a traditional uh, clinical uh, rotation to a 100% remote. Right. So, of course, um, this involves, again, multiple components, right? So the clerkship experience, a uh, large part of it would be patient interactions. One of the things that Sam mentioned early on um, was about telemedicine. I mean, something that this pandemic has really you know, brought to the fore and that was being done to a limited extent previously, um, more for like people who lived very remotely or where there weren't subspecialists available in more remote locations. So they would use telehealth consults um, to like the, the big referral centers and so forth. But in this era, everybody had to suddenly move their clinical practice to telemedicine. Um, so that's actually for the practitioners, that was something that we had to learn. And that I predict is going to be the practice environment going forward. So for example, I'm, I'm an internist. I'm very involved in the internal medicine clerkship um, that we have for our medical students. A large part of the, when we had to pull them out of the hospital wards, um, we did still have them doing some clinical activity, which was shadowing during telemedicine type of encounters. Well, you can see that that then lends itself very well to virtual or simulated type of clinical encounters because it's no different than, you know, they really would be indistinguishable, an SP at the other end of the line versus a, a real patient. Um, we were very well positioned to move some of our clinical clerkships to uh, an online format because we had already developed at the Gordon Center a whole series of e-learning programs. For example, um, you see here in the photo, what we call UMedic, the UM stands for University of Miami. That's our umbrella uh, for all of our e-learning programs. And we had developed some to go along with Harvey, for example. Um, there was an earlier picture that showed a student in the foreground uh, with Harvey, but in the background, they were using the e-learning programs. That has two modes. 
of instruction. So it can be used in conjunction. So students could be independently working with the mannequin. I didn't have to be there teaching every session or a cardiologist with them. They could go through the e-learning programs in a guided fashion, but self-regulated. But then that was relatively easy to just flip the switch and put that all online. So we developed on our learning management system, the course website, and we made available to all of the students in those electives, these e-learning resources. We did a similar thing with neurology. That was something that I was personally involved with. Um, and again, we have already prepared. So that allowed us to do it a little bit more quickly than some other institutions. But I think everyone is, is quickly following suit, taking what resources they had for in-person type of learning experiences, and then putting those online. Of course, you have to adapt, right? So the things like physical exam skills that they couldn't be practicing in person, I had to be creative. I had students in my neurology elective to videotape themselves performing the neurologic exam on someone at home, or if they were truly isolated in, in, the, in the early days of the, of the pandemic, um, they used some patient substitutes like giant teddy bears and stuffed animals and things like that. Um, but that the whole purpose was we were seeing their technique in performing the neurologic exam. Then they uploaded those and would share them in small groups with their peers so they would get peer feedback. And then, of course, I could rate those as well. Um, so these are some ways that we were able to take our traditional all in-person clerkship and shift it over to being remote. Um, we adapted both the teaching experiences and uh, the assessment methods. And that you are assessing, um, what would you give yourself on assessment of those of those sessions? How would you say they went for you? You know, on a on a ten scale, ten being obviously the best it could ever be. What would you say your assessment of those sessions has been? Well, I'd have to counter with another question, which is assessment of what. So clearly the knowledge stuff, which traditionally has been the predominance of our assessment still, right, has, has really been assessment of knowledge, that's relatively easy to do in an online format. Um, you have to do some special things for exam security, for example, remote proctoring via video, um, having safe browsers that lock down and prevent them from going to outside websites and so forth. Those, those technologies have been in existence for some time. So I think for that, we're doing great. For the assessment of skills, that is clearly more challenging. Um, and we had to be creative. Another thing that I did, for example, one of the skills we require students to be able to master by the end of the clerkship is to be able to give oral presentations, oral case summaries, like when you're calling a consultant or giving sign out about your patient. Well, I brought them into the waiting room on Zoom and then one by one, I admitted them in and they had a one-on-one -on -one session for me, a virtual OSCE. In that station, they had to perform a very quick oral case summary. So there were some of the skills that we were able to do. Um, cardiac auscultation, again, that sounds and things, you can project those multimedia uh, resources over the internet. So we are able to do some assessment of their ability to identify auscultatory findings, for example. So I'd say in the skills category, maybe I'd give myself a six or a seven at this point. Um, not for lack of trying, but because some things really just are hands-on. And, and that's why now that things are opening up, we are moving, I think, to a hybrid to recapture some of those things that really are best done in person. Good. Yeah, uh, uh, that's a fair assessment. We're going to give you an extra point, though, that you had to do this so quickly and probably somewhat on the fly to make it happen. Is that uh, I, I suspect that I'll be very interested to see what you have coming out um, and and your assessment of that and what we can all learn uh, learn from that. I know we're early um, in this. Um, Samantha, I'd like to ask you there. Um, I know that you you have to consider some of the. Um, um, student engagement, you know, um, how, how do you keep your students in physically engaged to these skills? So I think um, an unintended benefit that we've quickly learned was our ability to train both SPs and students remotely. Uh, we've been able to maintain engagement with a wider pool of SPs who would otherwise not be able 
able to participate due to travel restrictions or um, quarantine precautions for both students and SPs who may be immunocompromised. Um, this is beneficial for both parties as they save time on travel uh, to and from the center and while maintaining uh, social distancing. So it's, it has been challenging to overcome the technical difficulties, uh, but we've been able to successfully support and train our cohort of SPs and medical students just by staying creative and adapting to constantly changing conditions. Yeah, I agree. Uh, I, it, go ahead, Ross, sorry. No, I, I was gonna say, I, I would add a, a couple of things on there too in terms of maintaining engagement. And remember, we're not completely reinventing the wheel here. So based, you know, good evidence-based principles of education should still apply. So you know, um, one of the things our center is known for in the simulation world is the best evidence medical education, BME review that we did on the features of simulation that, that contribute to effective learning. And some of those things aren't unique to the simulation world, like the provision of feedback. So simple things that, that we, we tended to do here in our live courses like audience response system, right? So you can totally increase engagement in a lecture based format um, by just doing the polling questions like, like you've been using here, Darren, right? That gets engagement and you get immediate feedback. Only the person who answers, answers anonymously knows whether they got right or wrong, but they can see how their peers answered and they're, they're told what the correct answer is. So one of the nice things about a lot of these online tools is that they have polling um, capability. So that's a very simple technique, but that will increase engagement. The chat function, like we're using here as well, um, is a way that even though you're distant, you can keep your learners um, engaged uh, in, in the educational process. Good. I have to tell you, I... Um have a personal interest in all of this also. I mean, besides my interest as a, a simulation professional and with Lairdall, uh, my daughter is in nursing school right now, and she is faced with these difficulties that we've just spoken about. Um, there are no clinicals for her this semester. Uh, everything is done online. Um, she is doing those same assessments, Ross, like you mentioned about um, it's being done on a teddy bear. Um, on a loved one, on a friend, um, they get together. Um, again, um, it comes with all kinds of complications. And uh, so I think we're looking, you know, we're looking at those solutions. Um, and I think actually the one I saw from Laird all, uh, the modular skills trainer, I think uh, probably has some use and um, as we investigate it. Um, so are there benefits? Is, uh, Sam, either you or Ross can answer that, is that we, we talk about remote simulation as if it's a burden. Um, we all freely admit that it's probably going to be around for a while. Um, what are some of the benefits that you've seen from being able to go remote? So I touched upon a few of the benefits in terms of the standardized patient program um, and being able to cast a wider net of SPs to portray our cases and also for those students who right now our university is offering uh, a choice between taking virtual, uh, fully virtual courses in the fall versus coming in person. Um, I'm not sure, Dr. Scalise, if you have anything to add. Well, uh, besides, so we're no longer constrained by geography. Some of the courses that we've offered are, have gotten to be well known. Again, I'll go back to that cardiology elective that we've offered for, for very many years. We've had students from some outside schools that weren't able to come to Miami to do a formal externship. Now we're able to take that course. They say, oh, we've heard about this for a long time. I was just never able to get to Florida. Now I could take it. Um, we're no longer constrained by classroom size, the physical uh, space, you know, uh, before we had to limit that course to maximum, maximum of 40, um, which we didn't even like getting that big because then when we went into small groups, we only had so many Harveys that, that they could work on and so forth. Now we're not constrained by that um, in the virtual environment. It's also for our other learner groups. Like I mentioned, we train very many paramedics and EMTs. Those are working professionals nurses and other people just for something as simple as renewing um, their AHA certification, BLS, ACLS, PALS, um, and many of our other homegrown courses that, that we run here at the Gordon Center, we were able to split off the didactics and put those as 
online pre-learning. And so what would have been a two-day course of blended learning, mixed lectures and hands-on skill stations, we do all of the didactics ahead of time, and then they just come in for now one day, for example, of all skills practice and verification. Um, so that saves time, that saves money for jurisdictions that have to you know, be paying uh, people training hours and so forth. So if you can reduce those, those needs for travel um, and for days off and so forth, that is a, a huge benefit, I think. I think so too. I, you know, I came from the RQI world and uh, I, I saw those, those benefits directly. And uh, I like that you touched upon um, the number of people that can attend, uh, um, how your outreach now um, can be greater um, at it. I'm, I'm going to ask, a, a, take one of the questions. We had a, um, a question come in. It was from Barbara Fagan. And she's asking um, about the feedback from your learners. So I, I touched on the faculty and we touched on the IT considerations, but we, we didn't talk about what do your learners think about this virtual learning? I think that our learners are loving it. It's the next best thing to the in to in person simulation. We've um, surveyed our students, and the response has been great. They, it's honestly the next best thing that they could do. And similarly, of course, we do course evaluations for all of our all of our programs. And so, for the two electives that I mentioned, cardiology and neurology, that I've been directly involved with, we've gotten just phenomenal. Um, reviews from the students as well. And I always ask for, you know, now don't just get, you know, answer the Likert rating scale. Don't just give us the number, put some, some actual comments in there. And they have used words like so interactive, was surprised that we could do so much um, remotely and things like that. So it's, it's been good to have that positive feedback from our learners. It is. I, I have to say it, it, it's refreshing to hear positive feedback. It really is. That's, that's really great news um, to hear. I'm going to ask one more, one more question. And this is a, this is a thousand dollar, probably million dollar question um, about um, integrating, you know, when, you, when we return to the quote, not put quotes here, normal, right? When we return to normal, um, do you see that we're going to go right back to what we were doing? Um, or do you, do you think you'll maybe make some changes um, that more deeply incorporate the virtual learning? Well, I guess I'll, I'll start and say, I, I don't think we're, we're going to get back to life pre-COVID, um, honestly. This, this particular um, disease is going to be with us for some time, I think, and we're going to be dealing with that. So just as our, our clinical reality has changed, right? So the, it, it doesn't make any sense that our educational reality would get back to exactly as it was before too. Um, so we have already started to resume in-person operations here at the Gordon Center, but of course we've had to do extra precautions. Um, so you can see in this photo, we have you know placeholders six feet apart all along the hallway before you even enter our center. And then each person who comes in gets their temperature checked. Um, we either ask them, you know, screening questions on possible exposures or symptoms, or just recently the University of Miami has instituted um, a daily symptom checker app. So you can see this learner is holding it up. It has a green go there and a little QR code that he answered his questions. And based on that, it says that he's good to, you know, participate in in-person activities. Um, and then they, they're given, um, a mask, um, if they didn't already have one, hand sanitizing and so forth. We have one-way traffic through our center um, to minimize, you know, people congregating in, in certain areas and, and so forth. And Sam can, and can talk about some of the special things for the, for the actual simulation encounters itself. So I agree. I don't think uh, we can, nor should we, go back to the way things used to be. Uh, going forward, I think that remote simulation should be taught in, as part of the curriculum and to supplement our in-person training. Um, I'm also excited to see where the technology could lead to uh, and advance in the next several years as this becomes routine in many institutions. Um, as you can see here, we've started to also host in-person SP sessions. Again, we're sure to maintain physically and psychologically safe spaces for our SPs and students. All of our students and SPs are provided with PPE. They have face masks and shields or goggles um, and gloves for any physical exam skills. 
Uh, but I do have to note that our physical exam has been limited to maintain safety precautions. But as you can see here, our students are distanced and um, our SPs are still able to portray history taking cases uh, in, a safe, in a safe way. And you'll notice that in, in some of the earlier photos, which were pre-COVID, um, they were in their nice white coats, which we had always required before for, for clinical simulation activities. Um, now in the actual clinical environment, as a you know, infectious disease risk mitigation measure, um, we're asked not to wear ties, not to wear white coats, um, because we're just vectors of, you know, iatrogenic bugs, you know, moving around our healthcare facilities. So we're now having the, the students simulate exactly the same way that they would be behaving when they go to the clinic or go to the hospital. It's the same when they come for clinical simulations here at our center. It's great. It's the benefit. I mean, uh, I recall going through my initial training many years ago in the 80s and looking back after my simulation career, and of which I'll credit the, uh, your organization, the BME report was significant for me as an educator uh, of simulation and going in and uh, really thinking, had I had that opportunity to practice um, the way that I know now, um, how much better. Um, I'd like to move forward to some questions now that we're getting in. Um, one of the questions from Melanie Nash, um, uh, it talks about nurse practitioners and them being independent providers. And she mentions about many SIM programs, they really target undergraduate nursing, that the graduate doctoral advanced practices uh, are not really covered you know, as much as you do in med school. Do you have any thoughts about that or direction that Melanie might um, either start working towards for that profession? Well, so the University of Miami is a little bit unique in that we have geographically separated three different campuses. Um, and so we're here at the medical campus, which is co-located right by all the various hospitals here in type of a, a medical city, um, right in our immediate uh, environment. The nursing school is actually on the main campus in Coral Gables, uh, uh, the main campus of the university where all the other undergraduate programs are and the law school and the business school and so forth. Um, that is where the undergraduate nurses um, do most of their didactics, but then of course they come to the hospitals for their clinical placements. And of course the nurse practitioners or any of the advanced practice nursing trainees are, do, are very much present here in our hospital system um, doing, doing their clinical rotations, nurse anesthesia we have and the various subspecialties within um, advanced nurse practice. So it's more the advanced practitioners that actually come to our center, um, but we work very closely um, with uh, the associate dean at the School of Nursing who is the director of the simulation hospital. Um, we've embarked since that facility has been completed on trying to strengthen our cross-campus ties and doing a lot more interprofessional education as well. So our medical students and our residents will go to the simulation hospital and the nursing students come here uh, to our center, either doing you know, uh, in-center simulation, let's say in vitro simulation, or we're also doing a lot of in situ simulation right here in our hospitals. So the Gordon Center is in charge of some quality improvement initiatives and the nurses and the, especially the advanced practice nurses are a big part of that um, in, the, in our various hospitals here on this campus. Um, I would say just to try to partner, it really should be an integrated system. Um, you know, I think a great strides have been made in trying to break down some of the silos. We still do have a little bit of separation between physicians in training, nurses in training, physician assistants, other health professionals, um, and trying to utilize the resources that we have. So that's why, again, Dr. Gordon um, was really a pioneer and opened our doors to training other health professions. Um, many of the outcome studies we have done have been with nursing, uh, for example, and um, physician assistants, educators, and, and so forth. So I don't know if I've directly answered your question, but um, I would try to appeal to whoever has purview over um, the simulation resources to try to make it at least interprofessional, right? There's no reason, you're right, nurse practitioners are fulfilling a lot of the physician role these days, um, and they should be training 
to the same level um, with the same type of resources. So if it's not available at the nursing school, maybe you can try to get in with the nearby medical school if there is one and so forth to try to get some of that training opportunity. Good. I, I some, I'll summarize two of the questions that we have sitting here. Um, again, from our nursing, um, from our nursing base that, who's joined us today is uh, they're wondering about. Um, they know that in the the OSCE mm. format, it's a very high stakes evaluation for a student, and um, uh, you know, a, a, a high stakes summative evaluation is. Can can we make evaluations uh, outside of the debrief that still maintain safety? And in that same question, Sam, I'm going to add this one for it also was about, uh, we had an, a question about Zoom and the safety of the standardized patients, um, you know, in these. So uh, two part question, one about um, in the nursing, uh, can, you know, can a formative evaluation be done safely uh, in the simulation environment and how do we protect our SPs? So a lot of our formative assessments or formative SP OSCEs that we do include um, feedback and debriefing. So I think that that's a good way to include um, a formative assessment in your OSCE is by just adding a little bit of extra time for a conversation to happen with the students to accurately mm -hmm. reflect on their experience and then for the SP to provide their patient perspective. Um, and in terms of safety, I'm not sure if you're referring to um, uh, technology safety um, or if you're referring to, I'm not sure. The, the question specifically says uh, from Cynthia Osborne is how to maintain SP anonymity when they're on Zoom. And she says, do they use preferred names, pronouns, uh, patient name, and um, how are they coached on the background and environment? So there's a little more to the question. Great. So in as part of our training, we train our standardized patients to all rename themselves in Zoom so that it'll only show their case name uh, in the event that we've had multiple standardized patients with the same case name, right? Uh, we ask them to just place their initials at the end of their rename so that we can know who to send to which room correctly. So they okay. don't use their actual names, no. I don't know if people saw the one photo that we had, which was from a training session for the SPs. But it, you'll notice that there were nine people there. It was like a Hollywood Squares um, grid. And there were three people each preparing the same role. So there were three different SPs. And if you notice, they had the same name. And then the real person's initials were in parentheses there. Um, so yeah, they do really adopt the persona of the, the patient that, whose role they're supposed to be playing. And as I was saying, if it's well done, I mean, really, it would be indistinguishable from an actual telemedicine encounter. There'd be no way to know that this is an actor um, versus somebody who's really phoning in for their, for their telehealth visit. And in fact, some places have done this live where they have incognito SPs as a way to assess practitioners, so not just students, but to see what people actually do in practice. And I foresee this as an ideal way to do some assessment of, of folks actually in practice, um, at least their telemedicine practice, um, because there would be no way to know that this person is a plant um, and is gonna portray a particular or pose a particular clinical challenge um, for, for these patients or for the, for the providers um, versus you know, an, an actual patient. So I think that's an interesting, another potential uh, benefit of, of using these remote methods. Yes, I agree. Um, Sam, touching base back to what you had mentioned also, um, you know, debriefing, um, uh, certainly, um, I think we all agree that the education goes there um, when, it's, when the debriefing is good. It's where it happens. Um, I guess probably I'm thinking, um, when we look at the OSCEs, for instance, they're very structured, right? It's even in the name, OSCE, yeah. Um, it is a very structured exam, and there are point values assigned to whether someone did or maybe didn't do. Um, I would say in my experience in my travels, um, we don't see that as much in the nursing field. Um, we see very good debriefings. We see very good presented um, simulations and scenarios. Um, but I think maybe um, my question might be the evaluation that you guys in the OSCE and standardized patient world 
I think it would be very beneficial in the nursing. So even in addition to doing a debrief and making sure that the gaps are clear at the end of the simulation, um, that gathering some information uh, through the use of evaluation um, that you can start looking at both individually, uh, cohort, uh, program, is pretty valuable. Do you think we could transfer, you know, some of what we see done in standardized patient encounters into nursing at this point? Definitely, I don't see why not, right? We can adapt our assessments for, for any field, really. Um, what we do with our standardized patients is, aside, once the Zoom encounter ends, we'll have them log on to our system remotely and fill out the assessment on the students. Uh, not not yet on the session itself, uh, although we have received feedback on the Zoom format from SPs as well, which is resoundingly positive. And, and maybe to answer, maybe this was the what, what was an aspect of the question that was asked earlier in terms of it's not impossible for people to get feedback even from an OSCE format. Say you have multi stations, and I think maybe this was the question that there, there really isn't usually time built in for debriefing if it's a round robin type of a multi station assessment. So we, we face the same thing um, when we have our end of year assessments, which are meant to be kind of summative in the, in the terms of it's a barrier assessment, they must pass it to be able to progress to the next year. However, students still get feedback. It's just not right in the moment. So um, they get to see the evaluation forms that are filled out. So they move from one station to the next, they complete each task, each patient encounter, but at the end, they can see what did the SP write about my communication skills, about my interpersonal skills. Um, what did the faculty person, if it was a faculty rater, rate about my physical exam technique? So although we don't do it in the traditional kind of formative learning debriefing immediately after the learning encounter, you can still provide very valuable feedback and it can, in that sense, be formative, even when it's more of these very structured, as you said, time-based um, rotational exams. Um, if you build in, as we do, when we have our the end of year assessments for our first and second year medical students is, is one of the things that I direct. And we have at the end of that week, after a series of these assessments, we have a one on one where they sit down with a faculty advisor and they go through the portfolio. So then they get to see all of the evaluations that were completed um, during those various assessments. You're muted still gives you options uh, for program assessment and um, and also making changes you know in the program again these all fall in line with uh, what our accrediting agencies now are asking us to do with simulation um, thank you uh, Ross I, you, I think you answered actually a number of questions uh, that relate uh, I see a number of questions relating to assessing the student for sound knowledge and and practice and I think that that really that really you're cut out again you're muted Looking to see if we have any other um, questions. Um, Billy Maglo, Mag, uh, I'm interested in learning more about implementation. Um, were standardized patients the only tool used? So I think we'll take this as our last question, just given respect for our time. Um, did you do anything else besides um, simulation with the standardized patient? So in, in the pure virtual format, it was difficult. Um, to do things with mannequins, for example, or to do team-based type of assessments. But now that we're back uh, operational and doing our hybrid things, again, the way we are combining the modalities is to try to do most of the didactics online ahead of time. And then when they come in, it's for skills practice and or uh, assessment. Um, and now we have been doing some mannequin-based things. So the simplest exemplar would be, again, some of the AHA courses. Um, again, some extra logistical things. Now we have to have extra support personnel on hand because after every encounter, we go in and disinfect the mannequin. Um, even with the SP-based things where they're rotating through, any high-touch surfaces, the clipboards, things like that, we're going in and we're making sure that we sanitize you know, after each encounter, whereas before we, you know, kind of go a whole day or at least a whole morning, 
um, and we wouldn't necessarily be cleaning. If there was blood and things, of course, we'd clean that off, but we didn't have to wipe down the mannequins completely after each encounter. And of course, we limit the teams. We, we kind of keep it to three people only because that's about how many could fit in a room and still kind of step back and have a little bit of distance and, and things like that. So we've had to adapt, but we are now back to using also some task trainers, mannequin-based simulation and so forth, not just SP. I believe that's all the time that we'll have for, um, for questions today to be, to be conscious of everyone's time at 1157 here today. Um, I'd really like to thank um, Dr. Scalise and uh, Samantha Sims. Uh, it is always my pleasure to be able to speak with uh, the leaders in simulation and uh, we appreciate your insights. Um, I hope that, the, that you are able to walk away today knowing that you're okay. You know, that, that we're all um, learning this. Um, there's plenty of sharing information, such as the Laredal Sons, that you can attend. And if you're interested in remote simulation and some of the different ideas that we have available for us, please visit Laredal.com, um, look up at the Sim Capture um, line, and um, we'll be glad to talk to you about it. So thank you again to our guests. I really appreciate it. I wish we had big rounds of applause for everybody. And uh, um, Andrew and uh, Nick, I'll turn right back over to you if you have anything else. Thank you. Thanks. It's been a pleasure to be with everybody this afternoon, afternoon for us in Miami time. Um, and I'll also offer that when you send out the, the uh, links to the recording on the video, if you would, you know, feel free to share my, and I'll speak for Sam, our email addresses, if anybody yeah. has questions that they can contact us after.